So, um, first of all this morning, we're going to hear from Mary Hunt, a longtime friend of Loretto. Uh, not a member, but certainly a longtime friend. We've called on her numerous times to help us out with expanding our minds and our hearts with her words. And we also uh, may have shown some appreciation by giving her the Mary Rhodes Award, which is an award which the Loretto Women's Network gives to women who are doing special work for women. So uh, Mary Hunt is certainly one of those women. Mary is a feminist theologian who is co-founder and co-director of the Women's Alliance for Theology, Ethics, and Ritual. And if you care to take the shortcut, that's water. <laughs> <laughs> and that's in Silver Spring, Maryland. Um, Mary is a Catholic active in women church movement. And on LGBTIQ matters, she lectures and writes on theology and ethics with particular attention to liberation issues. She is an editor of a guide for women in religion, making your way from A to Z, and co-editor with her partner Diane New of New Feminist Christianity, Many Voices, Many Views. And uh, yesterday, when I asked for a title, she said, well, I don't have one yet. Actually, I asked all three presenters for titles, and I had nothing to write down. So <laughs> that just shows how much they are into evolution. <laughs> So later, Mary did give me the title, Meaning, Morality, and Meditation. No, I'm sorry, Motivation. <laughs> Meditation might come in there, too. Uh, the Role of Feminist Religion in Social Change. So thank you, Mary. We welcome you. Good morning. Good morning. Happy Valentine's Day. <laughs> and thank you, Maureen McCormick, for that lovely meditation. We love you. It made me think of, um, Saint, uh, of Bridget of Ireland. We're getting some feedback on the mic. Um, Where's the volume on that? Can you guys put the volume? If you turn the mic up there down a little bit, we won't get that feedback. Just turn it down. Yeah, just turn it down a notch. Should be good. It reminded me of, of uh, Bridget of Ireland, whose uh, feast day was just, a, what, the 2nd of February? And uh, Mary Condren, an Irish theologian, has written about the dew-soaked cloak of mercy. The dew-soaked cloak of mercy. That Bridget is the, the image of Bridget, the dew-soaked cloak of mercy. And uh, I love that image. And it's a very helpful one this morning to talk about feminist sources in religion. The dew-soaked cloak of mercy. I just love the image, and it helps me to move away from the notion, as Mary Condren teaches us, from sacrifice to mercy as the center of some of our faith tradition. It's so nice to be with so many people I love on Valentine's Day, and I hope you are with people you love as well. Just look around for a minute. Take just a minute and look around. These are people we love. Thank you. I want, to, I want to also thank those who provided hospitality for this meeting, both the planners and people here providing hospitality at the center. It's really a lovely place to be. I also appreciate very much, Lisa, your lecture from last night. It's good to have an economic heretic with us, uh, <laughs> joining a theological one. And we also look forward, needless to say, to hearing from Kim Klein uh, this morning, with whom I uh, have shared a lot and consider one of the most uh, insightful and wise people of our time. I look forward to our conversation. 
It's very Loretto, if I may say so, after 40 years of connection with this community. It's very Loretto to uh, bring together people who are thinking outside the box without apology and without permission. That's very Loretto, isn't it? Isn't it Loretto? It's very Loretto. But there are also people who share deep commitments for the common good, and I feel like I'm in that company of people today. Whether you're a member or a co-member or a friend or a newcomer, if you're in the company of this group today, that I think describes who you are, thinking outside the box without asking pardon or permission, and doing so with attention to the common good. My contribution to this conversation comes from the arena of feminist theology or feminist issues in religion. I want to explore its role in the macro conversation that we're engaged in this weekend as we ponder sacred economics and the future of life as we know it. I dare say it's easier in circles like this to talk about sex than money. So I applaud the organizers for inviting us to the, and it's not that easy to talk about sex in Loretto. Um, <laughs> I dare say it's easier, but I applaud the organizers for bringing us together for conversations that will take place later this morning and tomorrow morning as well for the Loretto folks. Decisions about how we share and use resources are not trivial. They call upon the deepest values we hold, which we form on the basis of solid information like last night's and today's input. Now, as I was listening to the lecture last night, I want to pick up a little bit where Lisi left off, because I think the closest analogy, if I understand you correctly, to what's happening with the situation of economics is Catholicism. It's a totalizing worldview. Many of us, it has 1% of the people in the Catholic community are winners. It has a 1%. <laughs> and it is not, right? Most of us are not in the 1%. And it is not constitutionally capable of working for everybody. I remember Teresa Cain years ago said, don't ask from the institutional Catholic Church something it is constitutionally incapable of providing. <laughs> I thought that was very wise. And I have come to see the wisdom of that. So having worked on those on issues of, of Catholicism and its problems over the years, I think I have about 40 by now. I think some of the analogies to what we're trying to do in terms of capitalism are really quite apt. Um, let me say it again, a totalizing worldview, 1% winners, and not constitutionally capable of working for everyone. In other words, it's not part of the nature of it, just like full employment is not part of the nature of capitalism, neither is full participation part of the nature of Catholicism. Just to give a little analogy, I just want to help people along, because I think there were people last night who were listening to the, to the economic questions and not really having a reference a real kind of at-home reference to understand how big the problem is. I'm trying to explain how big the problem is. It's also the case, I think, that there's no easy solution, neither to capitalism nor to Catholicism. Secondly, with all due respect, local efforts will only get us so far. Local efforts will not, in fact, do it all. Thirdly, if you want to stay at the task, I think what this meeting and what our lives prove is that community is essential. There has to be a place to do good, to have fun, and to be welcome. And without that, none of us, I think, will stay at the task or even be able to look at the enormity of it with any clarity. And finally, I think there's no right way to get at this. There are simply many, many, many strategies. And the important thing is that there's conversations among people who are trying to get at capitalism and get at Catholicism in a variety of different ways. So there's a multiplicity of efforts and strategies, no one of which I think is absolutely correct, but all of which taken together will at least get us a little ways and allow us to do good, have fun, and be welcome at the same time. <laughs> so that said, I'm struck by the very importance of economics as a discipline. Justin Walfers, an economist from the University of Michigan, claimed in a recent New York Times piece that economics is arguably the queen of the sciences. Well, theology used to be the queen, remember? <laughs> really, we were the, the, we were, theology was the handmaiden of philosophy. What's going on here? The old fellows used to, used to prattle that in every class, handmaiden of philosophy, the queen of the sciences. So I welcome the opportunity to sketch out some ways that feminist approaches to religion can be useful for thinking about our planetary future. My emphasis on feminist approaches is deliberate because I do not believe that all approaches to religion are necessarily helpful. 
And many, especially patriarchal religious ideas, in my view, are quite seriously part of the problem. But religions are vast undertakings, comprising beliefs, traditions, rituals, sacred texts, and the like. What I want to think about today is meaning, morality, and motivation. Those are the three things I think we get centrally from religion. Meaning, morality, and motivation. And I think they're part of what we need to deal with this larger project at hand in terms of earth and economics. And I will present to, in that direction and we'll see where we go in our conversation. I'll begin with a word about economics, then turn to feminist theoethics as resources for saying something about meaning, morality, and motivation. And I'll conclude with a hint of how Loretto and friends might incorporate this material into our thinking and acting. First on economics, I think that Lisi and the degrowth people make a lot of sense insofar as there are real limits beyond which exponential growth becomes dangerous, even lethal, a parody of itself. How quickly this is coming about and what happens in the meantime to specific people and specific species, especially those who are marginalized, is what I think we're up against. Questions about fracking, divestment, and the like need to be examined in the light of this stark but realistic background. Kim Klein laid out in her 2014 Loretto Assembly remarks something similar in terms of the end of economic progress. If you're right, Kim, and I think you are, we could put to rest some of our best efforts as laudable but dated. Simple living, stockholder resolutions, however admirable, are simply no match for the moment. Let us be grateful we engaged in them. Let us continue to engage in them as they're needed and appropriate. But let us now bring the same creativity and commitment that spawned those strategies to what is needed now, to the 2015 task. I think that's really a helpful way of bringing together what we've done, how we live, and now where we go. Because the best political progressives can muster seems to be something called inclusive prosperity. Oh, watch that term, <laughs> inclusive prosperity. The Center for American Progress, that would be the um, the Clinton administration and the Obama leftovers kind of in diaspora, the Center for American Progress, in their January to, well, and there, there'll be more of them. In the 2015 report, authored by no less person, a personage than Lawrence Summer and his companion Ed Balls, anyway, they claim, and I quote, the enduring response of progressives has been to find ways to share the gains of market dynamism broadly to ensure that all society's citizens have a stake in its prosperity, and therefore all citizens have a stake in its future. End of quote, summer and balls. This is not simply, uh, this is simply not enough. Given the exponential differences among such citizens, think of the 13 times income gap between whites and blacks, the, the uh, rate of environmental deterioration that such a claim doesn't even allude to. Our task, as opposed to the Center for American Progress, is to think about what we and our descendants, if we have any, must do cooperatively to assure a global future. I look to some resources in my arena, feminist studies and religion, to, to spark our imaginations. After all, none of us have ever lived in a just and tranquil environment with equitable distribution of resources where all have what they need and nothing more. We can only imagine it. But we can imagine it. And we've had some hints and glimpses in communities like this. And that's why I think the work of theoethics is primarily a work of the imagination. Let's imagine. It's not surprising that women who men have excluded from religious leadership have been thinking about ultimate questions for some while, especially Catholic women. I will limit most of my examples of feminist resources to the Christian tradition for reasons of time this morning, but there are many other scholar activists in Buddhism, Judaism, Wiccan, Pagan, Islam, and others who have very important points of view, including those indigenous or native peoples. Feminists in religion are used to being outliers in our field. Lisa, you're in the best of company. <laughs> I recently wrote a piece about Mary Daly, the great feminist theologian Mary Daly, and Thomas Berry, whom some people in this room have been interested in, and I referred to them as two Catholic outliers. It's a comparison of their work. I'd be happy to share it. It's coming out in a book that Orbis is doing. But I'd be happy to share that of Mary Daly and Thomas Berry as outliers. We, too, are outliers. We pride ourselves with Mary Daly. Not only if God was male and the male is God, but we pride ourselves in thinking well beyond the limits of patriarchy. 
or what Elizabeth Schussler Fiorenza has called kyriarchy. Remember that word kyriarchy? K-Y-R-I-A-R-C-H-Y. Remember kyriarchy? I love that word. Because what it means is structures of lordship, and it comes right out of the religious traditions that many of us share. Lordship in the negative. Structures, not ways of behaving, but structures of racism, of uh, economic structures, structures of class, and structures of gender and nationality, physical ability, even speciesism is part of kyriarchy. And so, in fact, what we want to do is see how lordship and domination baptized and confirmed by the religions out of which we come, intensify oppression and marginalization across those lines. But we're not new to this. We're not the first ones at this task. 19th century, uh, late 19th century, Episcopal Church activist and uh, Wellesley College literature professor Vita Dutton Scudder, some of you have re remember her from socialist uh, writings, observed, and I quote, 19, late 19th century, the lack of thinking in economic terms is fatal to a sense of reality. And every Christian is under orders to think how to think in these terms. The lack, the lack is fatal, she says. And then she went on with her work in the settlement houses with people who were made poor by unjust systems. And this gave Scudder a very clear view of how systems work. Contemporary ethicist Cynthia Molabita writes of her, Scudder decried Christian's tendency to see poverty as a malady afflicting individuals that could be addressed primarily through helping those individuals. Christian faith, she insisted, calls people to the social structural roots of poverty and to engage actively in advocacy for social change and systemic change. Vita Dutton Scudder was part of the social gospel movement of the early 20th century, a precursor to the liberation theologies of our day, in turn, I believe, a foundation for the work that we need to be doing. Imagine if we took her seriously. Rosemary Radford Ruther, in my view, is another one of the extraordinary theologians of our time. She concludes her recent autobiography with a powerful chapter called Ecology, Feminism, and Spirituality for a Livable Planet. Rosemary Ruther writes of her experience reading the Club of Rome report, Limits to Growth, 40 years ago. I quote, it became evident to me that the current capitalist industrial growth model of the economy promoted by the West could not be expanded to include the poor of the world. Rather, this model of growth was itself, in fact, based on impoverishing the majority of people in the world and depleting the natural resources of the planet. Sound familiar, Lisi? <laughs> there needed to be, Rosemary writes, a fundamental reconstruction of this whole system of relation of human persons to each other and to the earth. Rosemary Ruther outlines how the domination over nature emerged from the code of Hammurabi to the Greeks, through Aristotle to the fathers of the church all of whom saw women and other colonized people, and these are Rosemary's words, as tools of this, do of this domination and use of nature. Imagine if Rosemary Ruther's work were taken seriously. Another feminist theological resource comes from the Swedish Lutheran theologian Anne Katrin Jarl, whose book In, I N, capital J, Justice, In Justice, Women and Global Economics, brings feminist economics and feminist ethicists into conversation. My point in giving these examples is to show that we in religion, feminists in religion, are not worrying about transubstantiation. We're not <laughs> puzzling over divorce and remarriage, but we're really trying to get at the heart of the issues. Dr. Jarl argues, quote, the provision for basic human need is a generalized universal goal and provides a concrete yet flexible measure to improve justice. As a criterion, she writes, it's applicable to different strands of equality. It improves right relations, and it means diminishing oppression. While I would invite Anne Katrin to add Earth-specific aspects to her analysis, she shows how powerfully a change in the conceptualization of economics, from supply and demand, from sharing and giving, to really paying attention to basic human needs, can restructure our thinking. Imagine if her work were taken seriously. Carol P. Christ, a goddess theologian, not a theologian, but a theologian, that is, not looking at, at God as male, but God as female, the divine as female, a theologian, T-H-E-A. Carol Christ writing in Crete as a member of the Greek Green Party in these heady days of Greek economic upheaval, invites discussion about traditional rural life when people used what they required, didn't hoard or even save. 
They took respectfully from the land what they needed, shared with one another, and managed to live unfettered by capitalist assumptions. Carroll observed, while the capitalist mindset defines traditional rural economics as unproductive, Vandana, Shiva, and other environmentalists view them as examples of productive, sustainable, and bioregional relationships to the land that visionary environmentalists struggle to imagine. In other words, there are models for what we're looking for. To see value in traditional economies, she writes, requires a transformation of capitalist values. It requires us to see the meaning of life in terms other than making enough money to buy more and more things. So much is being lost. So much is already lost. Carol Christ, imagine if her work were taken seriously. I bring these examples to the discussion to suggest that religions have more than Sabbath, sabbatical, and jubilee to contribute to the conversation. <laughs> Nothing wrong with those, of course. In fact, uh, Northwestern University professor of religion, Lori Zoloff, president of the American Academy of Religion this year, proposed at the academy, which is the big kind of the trade show as I describe it, of you know, you have the, the, uh, the uh, American Medical Association and you have the American Bar Association, it's the American Academy of Religion, same thing, 8,000 people. She proposed in her presidential address, which was focused on the theme of sustainability, that the academy take a year off of its 8,000 person meeting and use the resources to educate people locally. You would think that she had proposed high tech murder. <laughs> While I think the biblical ideas of Jubilee and Sabbath and so forth are very, very helpful and useful, I want to expand the religious imagination. It is not so much the content of this feminist work that is already so much a part of our Loretto experience and our friends of Loretto, but the religious dynamics revealed that I think are important. Religions traffic in three things, meaning, morality, and motivation. If we, especially those of us who are women, who are not agents of our own religious understandings, if we are not agents of our own religious understandings, we're left with meaning, morality, and motivation that is foisted upon us from on high. Those of us who are Roman Catholic have intimate experience of this. We don't like it. We won't tolerate it, and we refuse to perpetuate it. But such top-down religious ways of being are not the only options. We can marshal our own resources of meaning, hidden histories, unheralded events, the magic and wild that Lisa talks about, new interpretations, uh, at least he talks about, new interpretations of old sacred texts, stories of ancestors, myths and rituals that celebrate the mysteries of creation, models of leadership and styles of consumption and sharing for which groups like Loretto are famous. The religious task of our generation, I believe, the meaning making in a seemingly inscrutable world has to be carried out in the matrix of real world social and biological sciences together with deep spiritual commitment. In the final analysis when all the data are counted and the evolutionary history read, I still stand in awe of creation, loving it. That I think is a religious stance and it has the meaning we give it. Justice, diversity, love, and mystery. And then morality enters. If life is valuable, then it's valuable for everyone and everything. Alas, we're far from the mark. Marginalized people must be among the moral agents if ethics and behaviors are to be adequate to the planet's present problems. Starting, picking up, and in some cases, even ending some ethical conversations is what I understand to be necessary if we are to have the collective bandwidth for today's challenges. There are old questions I think that we need to leave aside. Whether we take Uber or a pedicab, whether we live alone or in a group house, whether we buy organic or genetically modified foods, while important, and they are important, are but whistling in the wind given the enormity of, the, of what confronts us now. I don't mean to suggest that individual moral choices are immaterial. To the contrary, they express our best efforts to live with a certain coherence between what we believe and what we see. But rather, I think that the needs of our world are so far beyond the failings of our consciences that we do well to trust one another in groups like this, 
especially in Loretto that has been so attuned to these matters for so long, and use our insights and energies on those matters that have a larger impact. To those tasks, we bring to bear what theologian Daniel C. McGuire calls the renewable moral energy of our religious traditions. I love that phrase, the renewable moral energy. He, by the way, has just written a new book called Christianity Without God, which I highly recommend. I'll talk about that later. I love the phrase because it means this renewable moral energy means that just as earth and physical elements can be renewed with proper attention, so too can the many religious traditions from which we come be resources for figuring out how we need to live. Of course, it's perfectly fine not to have anything to do with religion at all. Some days, some days I think it might be better not to have anything to do with it. But for those of us who like our traditions, for example, the social justice lines of Catholicism, the intellectual power of Judaism, the contemplative dimension of Buddhism, the moral teachings of Islam, to name just a few. For those people, there are challenge enough in engaging in their renewal as part of this larger project of rethinking everything, from how we exchange goods to whether we ought to drive cars. Put another way, I feel more confident going forward into the very tricky terrain when I have some resources to draw on. This is one reason for the feministization of religion that my colleagues and I endeavor to bring about. We want religions to be resources, not hindrances to global strategizing. One among many, many ways of grounding our claims for justice and shared enoughness, not to say abundance. But where do we find the motivation? If we have meaning from religion and there's some moral implications, where do we get motivation to engage in this work? I think it comes from a wide range of resources of which religion is but one. Nonetheless, religion can be a powerful motivator, since for many people, religion is the font of their most deeply cherished beliefs of how the world ought to be, what their role could be in bringing it about, and how they can connect, religere for you Latin scholars, with other people to do just that. I consider it important to plumb the depths of our religious traditions fearlessly, to find the kinds of motivating elements that will add strength and vigor to our efforts, as well as to leave aside those curiarchal forms of religion that stifle and divide forces. That's why, for example, for Christians, the issue is not what will you die for, but what will you live for? The divine is not making things happen. Rather, somehow the divine is connected with whatever we do. These reversals, the very clear reversals that Mary Daly and feminist religious scholars who followed her have brought to the fore help to focus our motivation to create not death-dealing directives, but life-giving, life-affirming, and sharing abundance. Given a very dicey eco-economic picture and given that feminist approaches to religion can help to discern meaning, morality, and motivation, how do we operationalize this? Conversations like this weekend are a start, and Loretto is per usual in the vanguard. But to live out of such evolving consciousness, and especially to do so against the pressures of a society that wishes to ignore, distract, and deny the reality and urgency of our insights requires more. In my view, it requires nothing less than what we've already done this morning, thanks to Maureen. We had a silent embrace of a deeply held sense of common purpose together. We had a silent embrace of a deeply held common purpose together. No one can fully articulate it, but everyone and everything past, present, and future resides in its scope. I take solace in those who have tried to deal with these issues before us, grateful that they walked on earth doing their part as we, I think, are doing ours. I take heart with Loretto poet Cecily Jones. <laughs> Holding hands, we risk our way across to cheer and weep, protest and mourn, as wary of each revelation of the heart, we balance on the thin tensility of hope. Shall we? Thank you.